Okay, that looks like everyone is just about good to go. Yeah? All good? Okay. How's everybody feeling? Are you tired at this point? Yes? I presume everyone is. Okay. Relax. This is not going to be super duper high paced. We're going to pace ourselves here and um, it's going to make, I hope, for everyone a nice lab to round out the summit. And thank you very much for coming to the last session of, the, of at least the user conference uh, as it is. This is the OpenStack Orchestration Automation Inside and Out talk. Oops, let me get that distracting bar out of the way. My name is Florian, this is Said. We're both at Hastexo. Hastexo is a professional services company that provides consulting and training services, not just around OpenStack, but also around Ceph and other distributed technologies. You will find both of our personal Twitter handles at the bottom of the screen, and you will also find the company Twitter handle at the bottom of the screen. So if there are any questions that you have throughout the talk, we would encourage you to raise your hands basically as soon as the question arises, and we'll be happy to address it. However, if you feel more comfortable tweeting a question at us, or maybe a question that we shouldn't take during the talk, but after the talk, that's perfectly fine too, and please feel free to do so. In addition, I'd like to remind you that uh, on the schedule website, on the sked.org website that has the entire conference schedule, there is, for every individual session, there is a feedback button, and that basically just takes you to a little feedback form, and both we and the conference organizers are very, very grateful if you take that or use that feature very liberally. So if, you, if there's any feedback that you have to provide about the talk, about the setting, about the venue, about the room, then please do so. That is very, very helpful information that helps the, that helps future speakers, that helps future track chairs, and then ultimately helps future attendees of the OpenStack Summit. So there's a few words that we would like to start out with. This is not a talk for people who are completely new to OpenStack. You should already be familiar with basic OpenStack concepts. It is not for OpenStack novices. We will be assuming a certain degree of prior knowledge. You should know how to boot a VM using a CLI. You should know uh, what Glance is good for, what Neutron is good for. We'll be happy to teach you what Heat is about, but the basics of Nova, Glance, Cinder, and, um, and Neutron, that's material where you should at least know the boldface cult. You are entirely welcome and very encouraged to follow along with this talk because it is obviously a hands-on lab and I'm going to put keep this up for a couple of minutes. So if you go to this URL, and by the way, those of you who tweeted that QR code earlier, you already tweeted that URL. If you go there and then clone that to a local repo of yours, you are not only going to have the hands-on stuff that we're doing throughout this talk here, but you also get all the slides, basically everything of what you're seeing right here, and that is, of course, free for you to use, or you are free to use this, because as a general rule, we put our talk slides under a Creative Commons license, and so if you want to reuse these slides, use them for a presentation at a user group or something like that, or meetup group, then you can absolutely do so. So that's github.com slash Hestexo, and the repo name is, I'm sorry, it's long, OpenStack Summit 2015 hyphen Tokyo hyphen hands on. Yes, we did have three talks at the summit, so we couldn't just do OpenStack Summit 2015. Yes, it is about our seventh summit, so we couldn't just put OpenStack Summit. So that's why it's a little long. So it's github.com slash Hestexo slash OpenStack Summit 2015 Tokyo hands-on. And you can, of course, open that from your web browser, and you can, of course, clone this from HT via HTTPS directly. Or it can also, you can fork the repo if you feel like it and, uh, and then uh, clone that to your, to your laptop as you go. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, with GitHub. And like I said, that repo contains all the slides, 
and all the examples that you'll need to duplicate this. Okay, and uh, we'll give, give you a couple more minutes to get that set up. And of course, if you happen to sit in the back row and we have a very late arrival, then you can just point them at this as well. And then go from there. You are looking at the slide deck. You're looking at the sources of the slide deck. Is there a rendered one or is it just the markdown? down? Um, there is a rendered one as well. Um, I have the link at the very end, but if you just, if you just replace HTTPS slash github.com slash Hestexo with Hestexo.github.io, then you get the rendered slide deck. I'm sorry, I could have put that up here. If you go to um, hastexo.github.io slash, and then the name, the full name of the repository. So hastexo.github.io slash OpenStack Summit 2015 Tokyo Hands-On. Actually, thanks for pointing that out because it may be helpful for people to skip back and forth uh, as you go along. Hang on a second, I'll just open it up here. Just give me a moment. So if you just go to hastexo.github.io slash OpenStack Summit 2015 Tokyo hands-on. That's the one. Okay, so these are the exact same slides that are also available rendered on github.io. Um, and wait, how can I, hmm, I could zoom in. Actually, let me do this one thing here. Ah, darn it. Oh, come on. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. No, no, no. You don't really. Hang on. Let me just find that for you real quick. There we go. Come on. Where is that? Do, 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 do. Just go down here. Nah. Something is really weird with my page down here. Does that work better? That does work better. Here we go. Right? The bottom one, that's it. So github.com slash hestexo slash OpenStack Summit 2015 Tokyo hands-on. That's where it is. And then, you know, it's maybe helpful to just leave that open in a browser window for you. Is there anyone in here that wanted to clone the GitHub repo and has not done so yet? And if so, raise your hand. Is there a problem with that? Okay, uh, yeah, that's fine. It's okay.
Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, so if you if you wanna if you wanna cycle, <laughs> yeah. Let me just explain briefly how you cycle through the slides. You cycle through slides by either hitting spacebar, um, or so that basically will just take one slide after another. Or if you're looking at this on a phone or tablet, you can just swipe, and and you will then proceed. But yeah. Just forget that. Yes. <laughs> forget the unable. Uh, forget the unable to connect part. <laughs> that that that's the one thing that will only work on my laptop. Okay, so can I see a show of hands, please? Who's cloned the repo, please? Who has... Oh, wonderful. Right? Okay, can I remove this? Can I turn this off? There we go. So, if you would like to follow along with this, if you would like to follow along along these lines, then, and this is something that I hope every one of you who was registered for this talk a week ago already got by email, because uh, we asked the conference organizers to basically send an email out to everyone who, um, who, was, who was registered, which is that, of course, in order to follow along with what we're doing here uh, in, as, as part of the labs, you'll need an OpenStack environment, right? So what you're going to need is you're going to have to have access to an OpenStack cluster, whether that's you know, the private cloud that your company runs via VPN or whether it's a public cloud or whichever. Um, you're going to need Keystone credentials for that, and you're going to need... Um, a Nova, Glance, Neutron, and Keystone client on whichever box that you're using in order to execute effectively these labs, right? And this, like I said, that's information that we sent out last Wednesday, I believe. And I hope everyone got that. Say it again, please. That, yeah, okay, so that's, un that's unfortunate. However, if at this point you're not able to follow along or you just don't want to, that's perfectly fine too, then that's totally okay. You can still make the most of this talk by listening and participating in the discussion. As you know, all of the materials, they are available for you and you can, you're always welcome and free to walk through these steps, to replicate these steps uh, when you're back at the office or, or when you're back home or whichever. Is it dependent on key level or liberty? Or uh, good question. So the question was, is, um, what's the minimum version that, that these are built for? Um, we're trying to support a minimum of Ice House, which means that we're actually using, in the heat templates, you're going to find some features that uh, Later, like a Kilo or Liberty client may complain about as being deprecated, uh, but we're, we're generally targeting Ice House and up. So what you see here should be working with Ice House and up. If it's not, then please let me know or let us know, uh, and we'll, we'll fix that for the, for the next iteration. Okay. And of course, you know, if there's, if there's anything in here that we say that you can poke holes into, like we're saying something that doesn't make sense to you, or maybe doesn't make sense at all, then please do let us know as well. All right. So with the, with the preliminaries out of the way, with everyone who, who, who wants to and who's, who's inclined to follow along, having cloned your, your GitHub repos, let's talk about what this talk is actually about. This talk 
is, or this lab, is about automation. And I need to be a little more precise here because I already did a talk on OpenStack infrastructure automation, that is to say the automated deployment of an OpenStack infrastructure on Tuesday. Here, we're talking about how do we automate virtual systems in OpenStack. So to what extent can we automate the deployment and the configuration of virtual systems in our OpenStack environment? So who in here has run at any point Nova Boot or done the equivalent in Horizon? Oh, come on. Who in, who in here has booted a VM on OpenStack, has run Nova Boot or, 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 or booted up a VM in Horizon? Just about everybody, I suppose. What do we need in order, what is the information that we need in order to boot a VM? What's the info that either Horizon or the Nova client or the OpenStack unified client needs in order to be able to fire up a VM? What do we have to give it? So, we, so it has to have a name. We have to select the flavor. Do we, ha do we have to select an image? No, not necessarily. We could also be... We could also be booting from a volume. Um, what else? Again, again, optionally, we can define a network. I'd be hard pressed to think of any realistic use case where a Nova VM would not need network connectivity. So generally, we always define a network. Security groups, I heard in the first row, is something we can also optionally specify. If we don't specify it, then all the ports in that VM will simply be configured with the default security group. We can push SSH keys, exactly. We can define a Nova key pair that we want to inject into, into, the, into the VM. Now, that's actually, good, that's actually a good cue. What is it that injects these keys into the VM? Cloudinit, right? Um, what else can Cloudinit process besides things like the host name or the, uh, or the SSH keys that we want to inject into there? How can we, what can we do with a Nova boot or with a, with a Horizon um, create instance to automate the configuration of our VM? Well, config drive, config drive is simply another source of metadata, just like the Nova Metadata API service. No, but what can a, what can a user do on Nova Boot to further, to further, okay, a post install script. So what's the feature that we typically use for post install scripts? What do you call that? What is that? So the, the, the Nova feature is basically called user data, right? You know, there's any, so, so, so Cloudinit is populated with, with metadata that basically comes from the infrastructure and then we can define uh, user data that the cloud user, the person firing up the Nova VM can inject. So this is what a command line Nova boot call could look like, right? We do Nova boot, we define either an image or we, maybe we're also booting from a volume. We might want to define a key. We always need to define a flavor. We almost always would define a NIC, either with a net ID or a port ID. And then we can also inject this user data thing and then we give our VM a name, right? I think no one in here will be like completely unfamiliar with this, right? Everyone's seen this at some point. So. What do we, so, okay, so I heard earlier somewhere over here, what is it that we, that we can, that we put in user data? User. Scripts, right? Okay, so, so typically, typically the stuff that people inject via user data looks something like this, right? It's a shell script. It does some sort of magic, which I usually refer to as fropnication. Um, so it will initialize the box in some way, shape, or form, and then we'll do a bunch of other things in shell, and then presumably it might, um, it might propagate it, its, its exit code, okay? Um, who in here has done something like this? Like with a shell script? 
Okay, people, please stop doing that. <laughs> please, seriously, you're not doing yourself a favor. You're not doing the next guy over or the next person over a favor、uh, with this sort of thing. There is something much, much better that you can do with user data. Who in here has heard of Cloud Config? Very, very few people, and that is one of the worst problems that we have in all of OpenStack. Seriously, pretty much no one has heard about Cloud Config, and that's why I'm making it my personal quest to educate as many people as I possibly can about it. What does Cloud Config enable us to do? Just like a shell script, it enables us to bootstrap a newly booted VM. But unlike a shell script, we can do so in a declarative and not procedural fashion by simply writing a little bit of YAML. In my humble opinion, and you just confirmed it, <laughs> Cloud Config is, is, is probably OpenStack's most underrated feature. It is excruciatingly useful, yet far too people use it. What can we do with Cloud Config? So, imagine the following, right?、Um, so, who in here uses cloud images from distro vendors? Right, stuff that CentOS, Ubuntu, SUSE, and so forth make available for you. Right? Okay. So, there are some vendors that do really good things with them. So, for example, something that's not too widely known apparently is the fact that if you're using an Ubuntu cloud image, that Ubuntu cloud image is actually rebuilt nightly. So the Ubuntu cloud image that you download tonight has all the security fixes applied that were released between last night and tonight. That's actually it's pretty neat and pretty helpful, and it's pretty cool that、uh, Ubuntu do, do do it that way. Not everyone does it that way, and of course, you know, you might not keep your Glance store up to date all the time. Uh, CentOS, for example, respins cloud release、uh, respins cloud images on every point release. Um, Debian, I believe, does the same. With、uh, with SUSE, it's an entirely different story because the cloud images all come out of uh, out of uh, SUSE Studio. But it's a relatively common use case that you fire up a VM off of an image that has outdated software on it, for which, in the interim, security patches and fixes have been released. So you want your users or I, as a user, even want to fire up my virtual machine, and I want it to be in reasonably good shape as far as packages and patches and security fixes are concerned. So now that is something that I could automate with a shell script that I pass in with user data. But then we're quickly beginning to realize that things start getting sticky because I can either have, for the simple purpose of Updating all of my packages on the system, I'll have to have a separate shell script for SUSE and for CentOS and for Ubuntu, because they all use different package managers. Or I have a big long shell script that checks for Debian release and Ubuntu version and Red Hat release and so forth, and then either invokes APT or Zipper or Yum, and it's horrible, right? The, all, the only thing that I want to do is, you know, put that thing into an up-to-date state, and Writing a bunch of shell script is far worse than setting two variables in YAML. This is all you need to do in Cloud Config to update your machines to the latest packages that are available for that platform. And if Cloud Init, which parses this whole thing, runs on Ubuntu. It will do apt-get update and then apt-get upgrade. If it runs on SUSE, it will invoke Zipper. If it runs on CentOS or RHEL, it will invoke Yum. If it runs on a relatively recent Fedora, then it will do DNF. And you, as the cloud user, the person that just wants a VM with reasonably up-to-date packages, no longer need to worry about it anymore. And not having to worry about something that I previously had to worry about, I kind of like that. I don't know about you, but I like that. You know, there, there's there's this there's this T-shirt. Go away, or, or I'll replace you with a very short shell script. There should be a different one, which is shell script. Go away, or I'll replace you with very brief YAML, which is effectively what you get to do here. 
Another thing that you might want to do is you might want to influence what user accounts exist, exist on your VM. So, and again, that is an interesting challenge for when you want to get it right for all your target distros in a shell script, because you know, there's Debian Ubuntu, and there you have add user. You don't have that anywhere else. There it's, there's user add, and then um, groups are named differently uh, uh, across platforms and so forth. So doing all that with a shell script is relatively silly when, again, you can do it in YAML. That's just yet another variable in the YAML dictionary that you pass in with Cloud Config. It's simply called users, and what it allows you to do is it configures users and groups. So, for example, here, what we're doing is we're injecting into our VM um, a, a user account for a Fred bar, and Fred is expected to be in the group's users and ADM. We want to be able, uh, we want to set his shell to bin bash, and we also want to enable him to do passwordless sudo on our machine. And that's all I need to declare in there, and then CloudInit will just do the rest for me. If in the users dictionary I just enumerate all my users, then those will replace the default users, which depending on distro may be named Ubuntu or EC2 user or CentOS user and so forth, and will only get the foobar user there. If I also add the magic keyword default, which you see at the top here, that means configure all the users that I'm about to tell you in addition to the default user that you normally configure. And this is what I generally recommend is something that's very helpful because the default user, that's the one that gets your key pair injected, right? But you may want other users that you want to be able to define. Maybe you even want to precede their passwords and so forth. Speaking of passwords, something that I might want to enable for some or all of my users is being able to log into uh, an OpenStack Nova VM with a username and password. By default, that's not allowed. Again, good luck doing that with a shell script in set and awk. Because, uh, yes, of course, it's called password authentication, and you will flip a, a, a parameter that is normally no to yes. But where that config file is, is again distro dependent. Right? Well, do we really want that? No, we just set one Boolean, and that's much nicer. Okay, so just another uh, little cloud config feature there. We can set one variable, and that variable is named ssh underscore pwauth. It is false by default, and if you set that to true, then that simply means that sshd gets password authentication set to yes, and you can log into your VM with a username and password. So that's all that you need to set. There's more things that you may want to do uh, at some point, which is, for example, perhaps you want to deploy arbitrary files. And as you've guessed probably at this point, uh, you don't need to you know, fetch from somewhere and cat and whatnot, but you just use another entry in the cloud config dictionary, and that's called write files. Write files you can use in order to write simple arbitrary files, text files, anywhere on your target system. This is an example. One thing that you may want to do, perhaps, is maybe you're deploying you know, a few hosts in a, in, a, in a test or demo environment or something like that into the same network. And um, for some reason or another, you want those hosts to be able to resolve each other's host names via Etsy hosts. And then you can do it like this. With write files, it's a simple YAML list. You define a path, that's the target path of where the, files, of where the file goes. You define permission bits, and then you can define the file's content. For those of you not familiar with the construct that you see at the file content, the, uh, the vertical pipe, um, that's just standard YAML. It means that what follows is multi-line content, and when you parse it, please preserve the new lines. This is in contrast to the angle bracket that you may be, or the, or the, or the greater than sign that you may have also seen. That means something, something slightly different. That is, 
what follows is multi-line content, but remove all the new lines and the indentation when you actually roll it out. Okay, so in this case, just a multi-line file, and you can have as many of these as you want. And there is, there's much more that you, can do, uh, that you can do with this. So, for example, you might think, uh, well, I'm upgrading my packages, up, up, updating my package cache, and then upgrading all my packages. One of the things that may get upgraded is my kernel. Well, the security patches in my kernel actually don't apply unless I also reboot the machine. And that's something you can also do from Cloud Init. It's, that's, um, it's the power state entry, and you can just tell it to reboot after it's completed the first iteration, so it actually then reboots into the new kernel. So those are all relatively simple things, but maybe you already have a management infrastructure in place that you also apply to your virtual machines. Say, for example, you have centralized puppet management within a specific tenant. Say you've got hundreds of VMs in a specific tenant, and because you've always been a puppet shop, and that's where most of your expertise is, and that's how you're best, um, how you're best set up for, for managing multiple VMs, you want to do puppet on all of those. How do we configure um, a box for puppet? What's necessary for a, pup for a box to become a puppet agent? What are the prerequisites for that? What do we need? So we need the Puppet client packages, yes. What is that? We need certificates, exactly, right? Unless we enable auto-signing, which is a terrible idea. Okay, and what else do we need to, what, what other information do we need to give it? Where's the master, right? So where's, it, where's, where's my Puppet master? Anyone in here written a shell script for that? Like doing all of that in an automated, idempotent fashion? No, because that would suck, right? That would be a horrible endeavor. Um, so automating that from a user data shell script would be kind of painful, right? I mean, it wouldn't kill you, but it's a little like taking a dentist drill and putting a hole in your kneecap, right? It's not very, very cool. When you can do all that in YAML as well, because CloudInit has this thing called Puppet, and what that does is it configures your VM as a Puppet client. And what you basically do is you tell it, there is your master. You can also override the, um, the certificate name, and it actually does some funky parameter substitution there, so it will give you, say, an instance ID um, uh, dot full, uh, I believe that's a full host name, the FQDN, and then you can also roll out your CA certificate. And then everything else, of course, it does for you, such as, for example, installing the Puppet Agent packages. Right? Um, and there, are, there is, of course, a means in, um, uh, in Cloud Config to also point it to specific repos if that's what you want to do. So say you want your boxes to be Puppet agents, but you don't want to use the Puppet that ships in Debian, but you want to get Puppet from the Debian repos from Puppet Labs, then you can, of course, point it to an appropriate APT repo via Cloud Config, and then you just run this, and then it will get um, those bits from, from the Puppet Labs repo. You can do the same thing with Chef. There is even uh, a few extra features that you can configure there, such as you know, setting your environment, uh, whatever. And then, of course, you can also install packages. Again, you know, this would be kind of painful if you had to script it for different package managers, if you just have a list of packages that you can simply enumerate, such as, for example, for some reason or another, you always want Ansible and Git on all of your VMs. Here's how you do it. And even if you don't find a feature in Cloud Config that does what you need it to do, that's still no reason to write a shell script because you can write those shell commands right into Cloud Config if you absolutely need to, because Cloud Config also gives Cloud Init the ability to execute arbitrary commands. And for this to be practical, you actually have to deal with two sets of commands or two types of commands namely the ones that you want to run before everything else and the ones that you want to run after everything else. And we've got these two categories. We've got boot command, which runs commands very early in the cloud init sequence. And, um, you know, for example, 
if you are Swiss or German and you very much care about, or Japanese, and you very much care about precise timekeeping, then maybe one thing that you might want to do is make sure that your servers are immediately time synced right when they boot up. Right? And so maybe what you want to do is you want to run a boot command that runs NTP date against an upstream NTP server, so you make sure that you have exact precise timing there. Um, and then you also have run command, and that's the stuff that runs after all the other modules are completed. So for example, um, one thing that you might want to do, there is, strangely enough, there is as yet no cloud init command that does an Ansible pull. So you can configure with cloud init to Puppet, and you can configure to Chef, but you can't really do an Ansible pull. But you can do that from run command, something like this. So um, Phil was asking, am I talking about cloud config or am I talking about cloud init? It is cloud init that parses these cloud config files. So what cloud init will do is it will, um, it will you know, check out your, uh, your SSH configuration, your IP configuration, and so forth, and then evaluate your user data and or execute that. And what Cloudinit does is it looks at your user data and checks basically what's the lead-in for that. If it starts with hashbang, it assumes this is executable and it will select an appropriate interpreter if that's available on the system. If it starts with hash cloud hyphen config, then it activates the cloud config parser and does that. In either case, it is Cloudinit that actually does the work for you. But for some reason, everyone knows about the fact that Cloudinit can configure arbitrary code, but no one knows that, or very few people know that Cloudinit can do something much nicer, right? Okay, so with that, let's see. Here we go. Okay, hang on, let me just get into my OpenStack Summit 2015 Tokyo Ends on. There we go. Okay, and if you just, never mind all the script and timing and whatnot files, forget about those, but if you just drop quickly into the cloud init directory in there, then what you're going to see, let's just open that up with uh, VI real quickly, there's a cloud config YAML in there. And it's a very, very simple cloud config. It starts with the lead in hash cloud hyphen config. It does just what I previously explained. It does a package update and it does a package upgrade and it will do the right thing for whatever applies to your distro here. Regardless of what distro that is. So the question was, for RHEL, will this register to RHSM first? Uh, no, this won't, but there is an RHSM cloud init module that will do that for you. So you can provide your, uh, you can provide your credentials, and you can, uh, I believe it can even point your stuff to a satellite server, if that's what it needs to do. Um, but yeah, that is... That, that is definitely an available feature for, um, for in, in Cloudinit on, on RHEL. So it does do that. So the question was, should all the client images be packaged with Cloudinit built in? Yes, of course they should, but they generally always should when you're running them in OpenStack or in AWS or wherever, because otherwise your Cloudinit will not even be able to inject your SSH key. So, if you're building your own images, and for some reason you're building your own images not from snapshots, but you're building them from scratch, yes, you absolutely do inject Cloudinit into those images, definitely. So if the tenants are pulling their own images to run VM off, then this could be one of the requirements for them to have Cloudinit? Yes, if, you're, if, you, if, your tenants, if your tenants do create their own images, then yeah, of course. But Without Cloudinit, they're not even going to get much of network connectivity because uh, without metadata acquisition, you know, we're just not configuring a VM, period. Okay, so what else are we doing? We're creating, whoops, we're creating a user here. We are creating a user here. By the way, to be perfectly honest, this actually is 
a somewhat distro specific line because the group ADM does not exist by default on CentOS and SUSE. So this will work unmodified on Debian and Ubuntu, but it may need some, some tweaking if you're booting a different image. Does anyone not have an Ubuntu image available in their OpenStack cloud? Mm, really? You run an OpenStack cloud with zero Ubuntu guest images? Interesting. Cool. Hang on a second, just hear me out here real quick. And, and what we're also doing is we're enabling uh, secure shell password authentication and we are writing a few arbitrary files. Just for the fun of it, we're also installing Ansible and Git and then uh, we also do a quick run command to just spit something out on the, on the console. Question please. Okay, so the, the, the question was, what will happen if, if, if this throws errors, if, 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 something, if something goes wrong? Um, you already gave the answer, this being a hands-on lab, the correct answer can only be try it out and see what breaks. Um, but if you're, if, you're, if you're not feeling adventurous, um, what will happen if a, um, if, a, if a specific issue in the cloud config causes an error? Uh, Cloudinit will abort that module and will then proceed with the next module. But there may, of course, be dependencies here, such as, you know, you are, you're, like in here, right? You're saying, uh, we want to install the Ansible package. We want to install the Ansible package, and then maybe you're running, you're doing an Ansible pull from a run command, right? And then that may be sort of a, a, a cascading failure. But yeah, it will, Cloudinit will just, that module, that one module will just break, and then it will proceed with the next one. So, 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 so the, okay, so the question was, what if, effectively, what if we bust our, our, our cloud config file? What if we put anything in there that is not syntactically correct or uh, that just doesn't have a matching module or something like that? Is there a debug environment or a, or a, or a test flight or a dry run environment? Not to my knowledge. If anyone is, has written something like that, I'll be grateful for a pointer. Uh, but not to my knowledge, uh, so basically it is, yeah, fire up a VM, and if it doesn't do what it does, just kill it and fire up a new one. Is there any way to escalate the debugging level by some exception in cloud config? Uh, so is, is there any way to escalate the debugging level? Um, you probably would not want to because uh, Cloudinit produces copious logs as it is already. It actually produces two log files. One is all of the Cloudinit output, so everything that Cloudinit invokes and that generates any output gets written into this one thing. And then, um, and then there's also a Cloudinit log, and that actually, I believe, uses debug logging by default. And it's already very, very verbose as it is. Yes, sir? None of this is going to work for Windows images. None of this is going to work for Windows images. Um, to, as, to answer that, I am actually not sufficiently familiar with Cloudbase in it and its features for Windows. I mean, there is Cloudbase in it, which is sort of the cloud in it work alike for Windows, um, implemented largely in PowerShell. Um, I am not entirely familiar with the feature support matrix and which of these are actually supported on, or to what extent cloud config is supported. Um, that's something where you just have to check the documentation for cloud base in it. Sorry. Is there a support matrix which version of Red Hat supports cloud in it? Um, I, can, I believe you can get cloud in it enabled images, well, definitely back to RHEL and CentOS 6, but I think there's actually some available for for five as well. Um, Ubuntu, uh, I mean, Cloudinit actually predates OpenStack, right? Cloudinit was originally written for EC2. And so um, for Ubuntu, it's definitely pre precise that ha had that in there in the, in the cloud images. But I can't give you the, the exact version numbers. Is 
Is there, is there a reason to do this rather than, rather than use a config management tool? You can, of course, you, if, if you're running Puppet or Chef, then your cloud config file will be minimal. And that is, you know, point to the Puppet master or point to the Chef server. That's it. Okay, so what we're going to do now with this thing, and let's see if I still have my Nova boot command in my buffer here. Yes, I do, right? Um, so what I can do there is I do a Nova boot, I set a flavor, I define an image, I uh, define my nick, and then, importantly, that's the thing that you uh, can see right. Whoops, that doesn't work very well, so I need to move over here. So that's what you see right here. So the dash dash user data, cloud config YAML, um, that will then inject that user data file into the boot sequence. So we're going to fire this up. And this is wonderful because I'm, uh, I'm running this thing uh, off of a uh, Swedish uh, OpenStack cloud provider called Elastix. Um, if you're looking for a public cloud provider, do check them out. Their service is awesome. And uh, in addition, if anything would go wrong with this boot sequence now, I'd pick Phil right out of the audience because he works for Elastix. And then maybe he could fix it for me. But I'm pretty certain that that's not necessary because, um, as we shall see in a moment, boom, there it's running. And we're going to take a quick look at our Nova console log here. Oops, sorry, Nova console log test, of course. I am very sorry. Whoops, sorry. Let's do this then. So that's just a regular kernel boot, right? And we're all very familiar with that. Da -da 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 -da, blah, 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 blah. So this is where cloud init first comes in, right? Cloud init running the init module. And then, dum, 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 dum. Here we go. That's the uh, RSA key population. And there, as you can see, that's. That's our first output from the, from the package update and then subsequently, hopefully, package upgrade. There we go. So um, since I believe the base image here is an Ubuntu 14.04.3 point release, and so there's a few things in here that need, um, that need upgrading. So that was the end there already. So let's go back here and get the latest here from that. Here we go. Oh, and here we're already, I mean, this is, this is the completed upgrade, right? And then down here, we're getting to the Git and Ansible uh, installation bits. And finally, we should also see our hello world and whatnot at the very end. Oops. See, there's my hello world in the middle of the screen. We get that to the top, almost, right? So third line from the top is our hello world, and then just below is the, um, is the, is the date output. Okay? Now, Uh, how is the order of execution? The order of execution is, oops, sorry. The order of execution is basically built into, oops, come on, there we go. The order of execution is basically built into Cloud init. There is a certain order that, uh, in which uh, Cloud init uh, executes these modules, and it really doesn't have anything to do with how it's, how it's written in the YAML there. So, while those of you who want to follow along, uh, fire up your, your, your heat VM, uh, your, your Nova VMs, I want to point out that there's a few things, or actually a lot of things, that um, this doesn't do for you, right? It only fires up a VM, and it injects a key, and it configures the VM. 
What it doesn't allow you to do at this point, if this is in a public cloud, is it doesn't allow you to connect to it because it doesn't yet have a floating IP. It doesn't even have a router that's connected to an external network such that you can get a floating IP. Nothing, right? So there's very, very little uh, that you need there. And that's kind of like, you know, not very complete, a very complete degree of automation. And what we'd really like is we'd like to fire up a virtual machine or maybe several and we'd like to plug them into an, uh, um, a tenant network that we create just for this purpose. We want to plug that tenant network into a virtual router. We want to connect that virtual router to our external network, and we want to assign a floating IP so we can just SSH into that machine. Wouldn't that be nice? Now, that is where heat comes in. This is only capitalized because all my headings in this slide deck are capitalized. HEAT is not an acronym, at least not in this context. When it is an acronym, it means high explosive anti-tank, and you don't want to go near it specifically if you're a tank commander. HEAT is called HEAT because HEAT is what makes clouds rise. That was the, that was the, the, the original motivation. Now, what we can do with HEAT is we can deploy define and deploy complete virtual environments. So not just a virtual machine, but also networks, cinder volumes, images, even Barbican keys, you name it. Like pretty much anything that we can, Sahara, whatever. Anything that we can fire up in OpenStack or just about anything that we can fire up in OpenStack, we can also orchestrate with heat. In heat, we define a stack in one of two formats. Two distinct formats. Heat is originally or was originally inspired by an AWS service called AWS CloudFormation, and it supports, as a result, to a certain extent at least, Amazon CloudFormation compatible templates. Amazon CloudFormation uses a descriptive template language that is essentially JSON. I find that particularly painful to read, but you might think differently. Um, Heat also supports its own template language called HOT, that stands for Heat Orchestration Template, and again, just like Cloud Config, that is 100% YAML, and I don't know about you, but I like that much better. What can we do with that? Well, we can do what we just manually did, which is we can define to an arbitrary degree of complexity Nova VMs. And for that purpose, it has a resource type that's called OS Nova Server. And if I define an OS Nova Server resource that looks like this, I create a, a, a server that's called MyBox. It boots off of a specific image. It uses a specific flavor, and it injects a specific key. And now if I did that, if I define, and th this would be a complete heat template. If I define this heat template as it is, I could then use um, the heat command line utility to just create the stack. And that would look like heat stack create. And then I can either point heat to a local file or I can put point heat to, um, to a URL and I give the stack a name and then it fires up. But as it is, that stack with that definition that you just saw is not very flexible because why would I hard code my own key pair name into there when that is perhaps something that I might want to configure? Why would I hard code a flavor in there when that is something that I might po uh, possibly want to configure? And this is where heat parameters come in. So just like you can define resources in heat, you can also define parameters for your template. So in this example, we're defining three parameters, one parameter that we call flavor, one that we call image, one that we call key name. They're all of the type string. We all give them a description. That description can be used by various tools, such as, for example, Horizon, to describe what this parameter is all about. And for non-mandatory parameters, we can also set defaults. So for example, we might say that if the user does not specify a flavor for that VM that we want to fire up, then we're just going to default to a flavor named M1 medium. Or if we don't specify an image, we might want to fall back to a default image. Or there might be parameters that are always mandatory to set where it doesn't make sense to specify a default. And if the user fails to set the parameter, we simply want stack creation to fail. Simple as that. Now, how do we get to these parameters? Enter the concept of heat intrinsic functions. There are several of those. Get param is the most frequently used one. So what you do here, you're the resource definition that was previously hard-coded 
can now refer back to these parameters that we define in the parameters list using this intrinsic function named getParam. So we can define a parameter named image, we can define a parameter named flavor, and we can define a parameter named key, key name, and they will be injected in the appropriate spots in the heat templates. And now we can set these parameters. We can either do so from the command line, like here, we can set a key name and we can set an image. And the other one, uh, the, the third parameter, the flavor, we just left that out and we used it as the default. So we simply fired up a stack or we fire up a stack just like that. There is an additional means of setting parameters and that's called an environment file, which is yet another YAML, that's cool, yet another YAML ain't markup language file. Uh, so that's yeah YAML. Um, so yet another YAML file with just the uh, with just the, the 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 parameters in there. And then again, you can point those, you can pull those in from a URL. Still, you know, this gives us the ability to tweak a few parameters of our of our VM, or maybe we want to fire up a hundred VMs like that. Fine, but it doesn't really solve the problem of maybe we want to actually SSH into this machine. So perhaps we want to add some network connectivity to this thing. And so here's where, where we're finally sort of leaving the realm of what we can already do with Nova and, and, and Cloud Config by itself. But instead, we can use the OS Neutron Net and OS Neutron subnet resources to fire up networks. Remember, a network is just basically an abstract reference object in Neutron but also a subnet with an appropriate subnet configuration. Like this, for example, we might want to define a network named management net, and we want to define another network named management subnet, and they're of the type OS Neutron Net or OS Neutron Subnet. And we can define anything that we typically define on a, no a, Nova, uh, a Neutron network, and we can define anything that we typically define on a Neutron subnet, such as, for example, What's the IP of my gateway? Do I want to enable DHCP or no? What DHCP allocation pools do I want to define? What's the network address? And so forth. But we, of course, also need to plug that subnet into a network that we are also creating with heat in the same template. And as you probably acutely observe, there's yet another intrinsic function that you see there named get resource. And get resource does two things. It creates that cross-reference between those resources, but it also creates an automatic dependency tree. Because if heat were to evaluate all these, all these uh, resources just top to bottom, then you would need to write you know, first the network and then the subnet and whatnot. But in fact, that's not necessary. I could flip it upside down as well, because via the get resource intrinsic function, I do get an automatic dependency from one resource to another. So whenever I use get resource, then Heat knows there is an independent resource that needs to be created first, and a dependent resource that gets created next. And that's another, well, <laughs> extremely useful or rather required feature in Heat. And then, you know, continuing on with Neutron, we might also want to define a virtual router. We might want to define a gateway for that router, and we want to plug, uh, so that is, that is plugging the router into an external network, and we also might want to plug our just recently created brand spanking new subnet into our router. And that can look like that, right? So here we're defining, let me just scroll down here real quickly so we've got it on the whole. Um, so, uh, we were defining our router resource, a router gateway resource, uh, a router interface, and so forth. We can also specifically configure individual settings for neutron ports with the OS neutron port resource type, um, which you would then presumably plug into a specific network um, and then you can plug that port into a VM. Well, fine, but maybe what you also want to be able to specify at the same time is how do we enable, say for example, secure shell access to this thing. How do we do that? Well, we do that with security group rules, right? Well, of course, we can also 
uh, orchestrate neutron security groups directly from heat, for example, like this. So that's a security group that does what probably every one of you has at some point already done manually. It just opens up, um, a, it creates a security group and opens that up for inbound SSH and all inbound ICMP traffic. So you can ping your VM and you can secure shell into it. And then you simply cross-reference that again via a get resource function from the port to the security group. Relatively straightforward. Of course, you're going to be unable to actually SSH into your VM unless it's also given a floating IP. It's another thing that you can happily orchestrate with the OS Neutron floating IP resource type. And there you simply define, OK, what's the network that I want to retrieve that floating IP from? And what's the port, which then is plugged into a VM, that gets that, or that, that gets that floating IP mapping. Which leads us to another very helpful and handy heat feature, which is, you know how floating IPs work. You basically get a random floating IP. Of course, out of the pool, right? So, of course, if you are firing up an arbitrarily complex environment that maybe consists of, I don't know, three different networks, 50 different servers, two different routers between them, and three or four security groups. Um, and then you have like an, an, an entry host that you retrieve a floating IP for. You might want to know what that floating IP is. So you need a way to get information out of heat or out, out, of, out of the stack as it's, as it's being created. And that's where outputs help. So we, talk, we previously talked about resources, we talked about parameters, and the third thing we need to talk about are outputs. And there I can effectively take values that are present in the stack or attributes of resources and return them to the user. So for example, I, use, I might define an output named public IP or floating IP or something like that. And then you set a, a value for that output. And again, here's yet another intrinsic function called getAtcher, which will return the attribute of the, of, the, of the resource that you're looking for. By the way, in case you're wondering, OK, so how do I find out what are the parameters that are available for a resource? What are the attributes that can potentially be returned by a resource? All of this is very, very extensively documented. There is a hot reference guide where all of the resources that, um, that Heat supports or all of the resource types that Heat supports are enumerated. It will tell you what those resources are, what, the, um, what properties they take, so how you can configure them, and also what attributes they may return. And of course, you can use these attributes not just for outputs, you can use them for cross-references anywhere in your Heat template. And then this is how you retrieve it. You just do a heat. There's obviously there's a heat output list followed by the stack name, or you do heat output show followed by the stack name and the variable that you actually want to get out of there. Heat tells you all other sorts of interesting bits as well, such as, for example, what were all the events that occurred in the stack's lifecycle? What's the current status of all those resources and so forth? So now I told you about cloud init and I told you about and cloud config and I told you about heat but in order for this whole thing to actually be fun and really useful like exceedingly useful what you can do is you can combine those two you can of course do it in a slightly simplistic fashion you could simply say uh, okay I'm defining an OS Nova server resource and uh, of course just like the property that I can set on Nova Boot, I can also set a user data property for a heat resource here. And I can use yet another intrinsic function that I haven't as yet told you about, namely get file, which means just parse that YAML file and inject it here. But that's not cool. I should put another nope over here, right? Just don't do that because you, have, you can do something much, much better and much, much nicer because there is a resource type called OS Heat Cloud Config, and that allows you to run 
or to configure your, 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 your CloudInit configuration from within the heat template. And so therefore, um, you can, so here what you're, what you're doing is you're defining an o, a, a OS heat cloud config resource. And it's basically, you know, it's, it's nested YAML. You just put, in this case, you say package update true, package upgrade true, and so forth. And then you again reference that resource with a get resource function. But it's much nicer if you also set your cloud config parameters directly from heat, because we can, right? So here, what we are doing is we're defining, for example, the name of a user um, and the user full name, right? Um, and then we can simply pass that in as parameters for heat, and we can do a heat stack create and um, if we want to, you know, name our, uh, name our user, I don't know, whatever, a Canadian astronaut, and then use a full name of Chris Hatfield, then that's fine. And if you want to name your user Homer and use a full name of Homer Simpson, then that's fine. You can do all that from the, um, from the, from the heat parameter set. So let us take a look at that. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay. So, and uh, by the way, what I showed you earlier, the cloud init stuff, that requires no heat, right? So, so you can do all of that from, from, from Nova, and that's fine. If you go back into the hot directory here, you're going to find a single config file in there, hot.yaml which we're going to take a quick look at as well. So here, the stuff that I previously set on the command line for Nova Boot, I can now define with parameters. And for some of these parameters, I set defaults. And as it happens, the, 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 the flavor names in Elastics happen to be, so the flavor that I want is M1 Medium, and the image uh, is called Trusty Server Cloud Image AMD64. The key name, it doesn't make sense to set a default there, so I just want to inject my key uh, there. I then also have to define what is the public network, what is the, what is the network that I'm getting my, uh, my external, my floating IPs from. And then I can also set a username. By default, I call this user foobar, and uh, the full name is by default empty. And then what I have here is I define these resources there. And I start out with my VM with my OS Nova server resource. And as I said, I don't care if the resources that I am referring to with get resource get defined later in the template because it will happily create the, the appropriate dependency tree for me. Here is my magic cloud config that I want to inject, right? Um, so I define, I also, again, I say package update true, package upgrade true. Uh, I want to create the default user. This is an Ubuntu image, so it's going to be called Ubuntu. And then I want to set the username and uh, the full name for that user from a, heat, um, from a heat stack parameter. And of course, you know, if you, if you ever use this in production, you probably also don't want to hard code the password. You want to be able to, you know, pass in a, a password hash. But we, what we want to do is we want this user to be sudo enabled, and we want our users to uh, be able to log in without, uh, with a username and password, and not just with an SSH key. And then I do a few other things. I give this machine a port. Um, I, I create a network, a subnet, even a security group that enables inbound SSH. And then here at the very end, I'm also defining this public IP output, which gives me the floating IP address in my public network. So let's see, let's fire up a heat stack. This better? Not really, right? It does, well, I think you can still tell what I'm doing there, but let's just do this. Okay, let's, uh, let's be nice here. I'm going to do a heat stack create, and we're going to do 
We're going to boot that from hot YAML. And then we're going to add a few parameters. So I'm going to do key name. This is a key that does already exist here in my store. I'm going to name it Florian. Uh, I'm going to set the public net ID parameter to this UUID here. The image, I can actually use the default. And I want to do uh, username. Uh, what you, let's use Homer. Homer. And oops. Like this, and we're going to name that stack one. Like that, and then I'll fire that off. Hang on a second. I'm going to get to the output in a moment. Okay, so that stack is now being fired up. Uh, I can now check, for example, what are the events associated with this stack. Whoops. So this is the, these are just a few state changes, right? I'm firing up these resources as we go along. And that is still creating. Fair enough. Give it a, give it a little time. Yeah, there we go. I no need to put it on watch because it's done. And of course, one of the things that I get here is I get a VM that's named my box. I also still have the test box from earlier. Uh, as you can already see here, it is plugged into the management net. It already has a floating IP, right? Um, so all of that is already there. I can also see with my Neutron net list that here is my management net that I just created. I can do a Neutron router list. Uh, that is my stack one router blafu that's just been created. And I can, of course, again, do a Nova console log of my box like this. And we should hopefully see that that cloud init, cloud config process is already almost done. No, that's just preceding its random seed, apparently. So that is still working. OK, so um, this is the, uh, that's the uh, package upgrade and package update. That's one of the first things, or one of the very early things that run in the cloud init sequence. But what, would she, what we should see soon is us progressing from there. And this will just be another minute or two, I hope. OK, so here we are. We're already installing packages, basically done downloading them. Come on. Maybe I should have used a less outdated Ubuntu image. We would have installed fewer packages. You can give me a second, please. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, what's your question? Is it also possible to orderly shut down a stack once it is out? So the question was, is it possible to orderly shut down a stack? Yes, and I'm, and I'm about to do that. But uh, I want to show you that it works first. So that looks finished. So CloudInit is done. 
So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to do a heat output show, and that is my stack one, and what I want to get is my public IP. And then if I log in as Homer at that thing, then it's probably going to complain that I've previously logged into this VM, and so therefore it doesn't want, uh, it's previously logged into this floating IP, and that has of course changed. So let's do that again. There's our Homer, and now I'm going to do, and boom, I'm in, right? So that's a heat stack with cloud config managed from heat with Homer Simpson being created, put into the appropriate groups, the ADM and, uh, and, and users group, and we're exactly where, I want it, where we want it to be. Someone's screaming. Is that, it worked? Oh, was it, oh, that O, oh, oh. Excellent. There we go, sorry. And so that's for you. So if that was the O, oh, it worked, then here, there we go. If you want more information about the things that I covered today here, um, this is the, the go-to information page for Cloudinit. That's cloudinit.readthedocs.org. There you will find information about pretty much all the available uh, Cloudinit modules, therefore all the available functionality in Cloudinit. Um, Cloudinit is a, little is a little bizarre in that it's maintained on Bazaar. Um, but if you go to, uh, to Launchpad, uh, to the Cloudinit Dev Bazaar repo, then you're going to find an, an examples uh, thing in there. Hey, guys, can you hear me out for a second, please? Thank you. Um, just two minutes, and I'll be done. Um, there is a doc examples file in the uh, upstream Bazaar repo on Launchpad for Cloudinit. There is also the aforementioned hot reference. Those are all the heat resources that are available with all their parameters or properties and with all their attributes and what you can do with them. This information I've already given out. So that is this slide deck. The top URL is the is everything rendered as you see it here. And the bottom one is the GitHub repo. And everything is under a Creative Commons attribution share like license. So please, if you if you feel this, if you consider this slide deck useful for your next meetup group or for for your next uh, for your next meeting at work, then please, by all means, feel free to do so. Use it. That's what it's for. And if you want to find out what uh, our company does with OpenStack, then please go ahead and visit histexo.com/openstack for our landing page. And with that. I thank you very much for your patience, for your endurance uh, throughout uh, the OpenStack Summit and parties and what have you. And I want to say thank you for coming first and then take questions. Thanks. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, so just to repeat that, uh, Cloudinit itself, just like anything else in OpenStack, is written in Python. Um, the, um, and and the, 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 the modules are reasonably well documented. They're also reasonably well legible. Um, so just you know, learning from existing modules is not hard at all. So yes, if you do want to add functionality, then by all means, you can totally do so. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, the next OpenStack user is, will be grateful to you. And also EC2 user, actually. Is there a rudimentary support for conditionals and in the 
Is there rudimentary support for conditionals and loops in heat? Yes. Next question. Um, in, in cloud config, um, hmm. Well, that's actually a really good question. In cloud config itself, I'm not aware of it, but then there's like really, really funky things that you can do with YAML with like indirections and cross references and whatnot. Um, but I wouldn't know. Sorry. But you can certainly do it in heat. If, good question. If you want to create not one, not two, not three, but 100 VMs, uh, you can um, configure something that he calls a resource group. And then you're basically defining a template. And then you say, I want this x many times. And you can not only, you can not only do that with VMs. If you, if you want to do 100 tenant networks, then you get 100 tenant networks. There's, there's, more interesting stuff that you can do with, with Heat as well. A cloud, a cloud config supports um, multi-part configuration, so you can have like individual parts that you put together uh, from within Heat, and you automate that. So I scratched the surface here, but yeah, you can definitely configure multiple resources in one definition. Excellent. Good question. Excellent question. Um, what if I make changes to an existing heat template? This is excellently documented in the uh, hot reference because for every property that you see there, um, it will either say can be replaced without update or updates cause replacement, which means that when you change this specific parameter, either heat can update that parameter in place so one example is um, you can change the flavor of a VM. That is something that is updatable. It will just go to the resize state and then continue. There are others, like for example, if you're actually changing cloud config. Cloud config is only ever applied on first boot. So if you're changing cloud config, then that means that that VM that uses that cloud config is simply going to be rebuilt. But this is, like I said, for every single resource, for every single property of, the, of, of, a, of a resource, this is documented in the hot reference. Look for either updates cause replacement or can be replaced with, uh, can be updates cause replacement or can be updated without replacement, something like that. So there is a list of mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Oh, and, and sorry, and you can also do, um, you, can, you can change parameters from heat with heat stack update. You can do lots of other cool things with, uh, with heat, um, which um, is you can suspend stacks, resume stacks as a whole. Um, so all of that is, uh, is, is, is really cool. Um, in fact, um, yeah, we're using it for something really neat. And if you want to read more about that, it's kind of out of scope for this talk. But if you want to read more about uh, what we do, that is actually um, a really, really neat heat application, then go to www.stexo.com slash open edX. So replace the stack with edX, so open edX. That's just something that we very recently announced. And if you're interested in getting your people or your colleagues or the team uh, trained on OpenStack or Ceph or Docker or, uh, or OVN or something like that in a really, really neat and immersive manner, then do contact us about that. So that's stexo.com slash open edics. And with that, we are, I'm sorry, we're out of time. I'll, I'll be happy to take your question later, but we are out of time. Again, thank you very much for coming. I hope this was informative and enjoyable. And um, safe travels back home, everyone.